So welcome everyone to tonight's uh, constitutional conversation. It's always a special pleasure when I get to welcome a former student of mine. So uh, Tom was a student that back when I taught at University of Chicago, when that was sometime in the last century. Um, and uh, he has had a very distinguished career, uh, primarily focusing on the uh, First Amendment law of church and state, but in patents and a number of other things as well. Uh, he's co-editor of the uh, textbook, uh, the case book, that some of us will be dipping into on religion and the Constitution. Uh, he's the James Overstar uh, Professor at uh, St. Thomas University in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. He has his JD from Chicago, his master's degrees in religion and in philosophy from Chicago and Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. And what else do you need to know? He's speaking tonight on the very timely topic of uh, relig religious liberty in an age of polarization. So please uh, welcome Tom Burke. be here. Uh, thank you to uh, Rebecca and to uh, Morgan Wyland who uh, helped uh, with logistics uh, before she went on maternity leave, I, I guess, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, of course, I want to thank Michael for inviting me and getting me out of the snow and sub-zero temperatures of Minnesota. I know it seems cold to you, but <laughs> it's not. Um, and, but I, I just want to thank him you know, very briefly for uh, being a real um, model, a mentor, an intellectual model, not only for the way in which he uh, reframed in many ways, in very helpful ways, the law of church and state uh, and, and, and his influence in our field, but for me personally as a a mentor, uh, an advisor, and, and a model of how to combine uh, rigorous scholarship with an involvement in, uh, in the practical world, in, in litigation, and in other ways. So uh, it's great to be here, and uh, uh, I'm happy to talk about this issue, which is a difficult issue. Uh, so let me just get right into it, and then we'll have a little time to talk, to uh, discuss some questions afterwards. So, it's no newsflash that America today is deeply polarized between competing political cultural outlooks. A slew of books describe how Americans are undergoing a big sort, clustering with like-minded people in not just in our political party, but in our preferred news sources, our houses of worship, residential neighborhoods, groceries, and models of cars. As our positive contact with people on the other side decreases, so does our empathy for them, replaced by fear and anger. The list of polarizing issues includes the constitutional right of religious freedom. The last dozen years has seen multiple high-profile instances of laws clashing with religious tenets and practices. There's the long-running litigation over the Obama administration's contraception mandate. Uh, there are the clashes between uh, LGBT non-discrimination laws and those who object to supporting same-sex marriage, the Catholic foster care agency, the small wedding vendor like the Cape, or the website designer. In those cases, traditionalist religious adherents face restrictions from progressive laws. But the positions flip as to Muslim Americans. There, many conservative Christians have favored discriminatory restrictions on religion, such as President Trump's ban on travel from six Muslim nations. But in all these cases, divides over religious liberty have traced and intensified the divides on the underlying policy issues. So if you support LGBTQ non-discrimination laws, then you oppose any meaningful exemptions from them for religious objectors. 
If you support immigration restrictions, you dismiss any religious freedom challenge to those restrictions. Both, it happens on both the left and the right. So this is a bad development. That's my main thesis. Let me click through here and see. Religious freedom is meant, you know, turned around there, crick in your neck, uh, meant not to aggravate conflict among deeply held views, but rather to calm it by protecting people of different views against threats they feel to their most basic beliefs and identity. We must renew our commitment to religious freedom for all. And that assertion has three parts. So, uh, first, we should place strong value on religious freedom, which I define as the ability of people and religious communities to live consistent with their deepest beliefs and identity unless there's a powerful reason to restrict them. Second, that strong standard of protection must extend to all faiths. We need to protect, for example, Muslims and conservative Christians. Finally, for religious freedom to be credible, there must be boundaries on it, set by the important rights of other individuals and the interests of society. It's a delicate task, but careful analysis can maximize our ability to serve both religious freedom and other important goals. So at the end, I can only begin to touch on, on examples of that, but I, I will at the end discuss how courts and legislatures can do so with respect to religious freedom and LGBTQ equality. So first, what is the problem? Let's begin with treatment of Muslims. In 2016, when candidate Donald Trump issued his call for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States, I quote, the proposal received support from 71% of Republicans, according to polls. Now, Trump eventually adopted the more limited ban on travel from six countries, which the Supreme Court upheld by a 5-4 vote in 2018. Wrongly, uh, I think. Uh, but the uh, original proposal, which would have targeted the entire Muslim religion, was also very popular among conservatives. Opposition to construction of mosques has also been significant in recent years and has been driven by conservative politicians, activists, and preachers. That same coalition promoted greatly overbroad bans on quote unquote Sharia law in the U.S. So now turn to disputes the other way. Traditionalist Christians raising religious liberty objections against laws that force them to fund a contraception coverage or assist same-sex weddings. But these cases span a, a wide range of situations and call for different uh, variety of results and uh, uh, can argue many of them uh, in different, different ways. But in the last decades, many progressives and liberals became hostile not just to particular claims, but to the idea of giving religious liberty any real weight when the religious conduct in question is discriminatory. The, uh, the Democratic majority on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights uh, issued an official report saying that any religious freedom exceptions from non-discrimination laws must be rejected or very narrowly confined. And the chairman of the commission added that religious liberty claims in this context were simply code words for discrimination, intolerance, racism, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, and Christian supremacy. The U.S. Solicitor General uh, the government's advocate in the Supreme Court told the justices in 2015 that withdrawal of federal tax exemptions for religious nonprofit organizations that rejected same sex marriage was, again, quote, certainly going to be an issue, which would be have a huge effect on those institutions. Liberals and progressives also turned against the religious freedom. Restoration Acts, or RIFRAs, passed in Congress in 20, about 20 states that require government to have a, uh, a strong reason when it uh, imposes a substantial burden on religious freedom. The original statute that gave that protection to religious exercise passed Congress almost unanimously in 1993. But, oh, Liberals now block such bills on the ground that they might protect persons or institutions 
that object to facilitating same-sex marriages or transgender conduct. And two bills pending in Congress would make this statute entirely inapplicable to claim any claim brought under federal non-discrimination laws. Now, so I think these are significant overreactions. Uh, the major effect of these statutes, Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, is to protect religious minorities and other vulnerable groups in settings quite different from the non-discrimination disputes. Rulings under RIFRAs have ordered exceptions to protect Muslim inmates wearing a beard, uh, Native American students uh, wearing long hair in public schools, religious ministries housing and feeding uh, homeless persons, and religious individuals who are giving food and water to undocumented immigrants crossing uh, perilous, doing perilous crossings in the Southwest Desert. Eliminating RIFRAs in all non-discrimination cases is also a significant uh, overreaction. It withdraws protection uh, even for deeply religious organizations, no matter how serious the clash with their belief or how easy it is to find alternative service providers. So, say more, but in short, I think the cases that both left and right downplay religious liberty and support it selectively. And this is bad for several reasons. Religious liberty is designed among other things, to allow people of fundamentally different views to coexist and to have space to live consistently with their views. Religious liberty took hold in the West because of the political and religious battles of the Reformation. Protestants had killed Catholics and vice versa because each feared the other side would kill them upon taking power. So consider, for example, Thomas More. There he is, by portrait by, by Holbein, the painter. Catholic martyr for the cause of conscience for his refusal to sign the oath declaring Henry VIII the supreme head of the English church. Now, More had refused to fault anyone else who uh, did sign the oath, but he said, his conscience so moves me in the matter uh, that he couldn't swear it himself. But earlier, when England was still Catholic, Moore, as Lord Chancellor, had hunted down Protestant writers and booksellers and delivered them over to the civil authorities to be burned for heresy. And those victims became martyrs for Protestant freedom, eulogized in books like Fox's Book of Martyrs, a famous uh, account. In the Tudor culture wars, each side sought freedom for itself while denying it to its opponents. That's not religious freedom, even if the combatants on the two sides use words like freedom or rights of conscience. To claim freedom for your side while ignoring it for opponents is an instrument of policy. It's a means of advancing your favored faith. So the British American colonists brought Reformation attitudes and conflicts with them, especially the inclination to uh, freedom for me, for me, but not for you. The Puritans journeyed to North America because they feared persecution at home. Once they arrived, they began persecuting dissenters. So America's founders largely, significantly rejected that vicious cycle. Our tradition has been far from perfect, but it has generally worked towards the ideal set forth in the 1776 Virginia Declaration of Rights, that all persons are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience. That provision emphasizes protecting freedom both vigorously, free exercise according to the dictates of conscience, and equally for all. It served as the model for the free exercise clause of the First Amendment and for the elimination of compulsory contributions to, to churches uh, in the 1780s. And James Madison, uh, I'll quote here from him, uh, ex explain in, in opposing uh, those taxes that compulsion in religious matters worsens existing religious differences, makes the discord worse and even violent. 
Well, he says, and I'll let you just read it on the, on the screen there, the, re the remedy of equal and complete liberty in religious matters destroys the malignant influence of such conflicts on the health and prosperity of the state. So polarization in today's political culture wars is likewise driven by resentment and fear toward the other side. Among the 81% of evangelical Christians who voted for Donald Trump in 2016, that's the percentage, uh, a significant number of them did so, despite articulated misgivings about his character, because they feared what Democrats might do on religious liberty questions. And those fears, unfortunately, I think had some basis. Religious liberty protections and help calm those existential fears which tend to trigger extreme defensive reactions. So we should protect religious freedom not only because that will reduce conflict, but because religious identity is very important to people. So it's, we can see this and maybe I hope promote a, a, a bit of understanding of, of, across political lines by seeing the parallels between the claims of, say, same-sex couples and those of religious objectors. The, my case here, these few slides, is the strongest features of the case for same-sex marriage also make a strong case for, for uh, protecting the religious liberty of dissenters. Okay, so, first feature, first kind of parallel, is that both uh, involve per, uh, important aspects of personal identity. Both same-sex couples and committed religious believers argue that some aspects of human identity are so fundamental that they should be left to each individual free of all non-essential regulation. For same-sex couples, the conduct of issue is the joint personal commitment and sexual expression in a multifaceted, intimate relationship with the person they love. But religious commitment is no less a central feature of personal identity. Religious believers seek to live consistently with the commands of the being that they believe made us and holds the world together. When the law conflicts with their commitment, they face a painful choice between authorities. And, as the marriage relationship is pervasive in a person's life, so too is religious commitment. People integrate a remarkable range of actions together under the umbrella of their religious life. They raise and educate their children, they mark births and deaths, they meet weekly for sessions of inspiration, they receive personal counseling and moral guidance, and they devote time to serving others. Okay, so second, for, for both groups, their identity is uh, at most impossible and at the very least painful uh, to change. No person who wants to enter into a same-sex marriage can change his sexual orientation by any simple act of will, but neither can any religious believer change his understanding of divine command by any simple act of will. Third, the identity is closely tied to conduct. So the states that refused same-sex marriage argued that they were acting based not on sexual orientation, but on people's conduct of acting in, in a marriage, uh, in a relationship. In essence, they claimed that a gay man suffered no inequality or burden because he could remain celibate or marry a woman. The courts correctly rejected that argument. They said that both the orientation and the conduct that follows from it or central to the person's identity. Religious believers face similar attempts to distinguish their religious beliefs from the conduct based on those beliefs and to treat their conduct as subject to any and all state regulation. Critics sometimes say to the religious claimant, you can believe whatever you want, but you can't act on it. But believers can't fail to act on God's will both religious believers and same-sex couples feel compelled to act on those things that are constitutive of their identity. And then the last parallel is that the conduct involved is not merely insular, private, but also public. Same-sex couples claim a right to live outside the closet and to participate in the social institutions of civil marriage and family, 
Religious believers likewise claim a right to follow their faith, not just in the insular setting of the home or the congregation, but in the charitable work of their religious organizations and in their workplace. The, the seriousness of these impositions, which is the point I've been making here, uh, on religious believers and on same-sex couples ties into the earlier point about reduction of conflict. The seriousness of the imposition is what causes conflict from them. Threats to important aspects of your identity cause fear, anger, and retaliation. So the classic American solution to this problem is to protect the liberty of both sides. Those who believe the court was right to protect, recognize same-sex civil marriage, as I do, should also recognize significant rights for dissenting religious individuals and organizations, and for religious liberty in other contexts. Okay, so what do we need to do then to protect religious liberty strongly and responsibly in general, and I'll just give an example here of the context of LGBTQ non-discrimination. Uh, so first, it is vital to, uh, to develop and work through and think through sound principles for setting, setting the boundaries of religious freedom versus societal interests and others' rights. You can only do so that, that briefly here, just to touch on it. It's a general matter, courts that are drawing boundaries on religious freedom in litigation and legislatures that are drafting statutory protections should consider various factors. The severity of any harm for the religious conduct clearly matters. Uh, we would obviously at the extreme never allow any claim of a right to human sacrifice. Another relevant factor is how close the question in, uh, conduct in question lies to the core of religion. Protection for houses of worship, going to be very strong, sometimes absolute, uh, but inevitably protection will be more limited for safe conduct in the commercial sphere, uh, which I'll say more in a moment. In the specific context of non-discrimination laws and religious liberty, uh, the context I want to focus on now, the effects on others from a religious exemption can be mitigated by two factors that I'll just touch on. Notice of the, no, others having notice of the religious claimant's policy, the religious institution's discriminatory policy, and the availability of alternative providers. So those factors, notice alternative providers, can call for very substantial protection for religious nonprofit organizations like schools and social <coughs> services. Typically, they're openly religious nature. They are openly religious. Gives notice that they may well adhere to religious principles concerning conflict, conduct of employees or the limits of their services. And typically, beneficiaries then can know that and, uh, and go elsewhere. And typically, beneficiaries have many alternative providers. There are many public or non-religious colleges that don't follow uh, traditionalist sexual norms. Many foster care agencies happy to serve same-sex couples and so forth. There are exceptions. Some, we have in some places the only reasonably accessible hospital is a Catholic hospital. That uh, can present troublesome cases. Some non-Catholic hospitals that have purchased Catholic hospitals uh, take on contractual commitments that are not apparent to outsiders to follow Catholic uh, bioethical norms. Elizabeth Sepper at the University of Texas calls these zombie religious institutions. Uh, they are, the religious norm is carrying on even though it's, it's, it's not really tied to an ongoing religious community. But those exceptions shouldn't undermine a general rule of broad protection for religious nonprofits. Now, what about the for-profit business, such as the small baker or the wedding photographer? In that sphere, protections for refusal of service clearly have to be limited and carefully defined. There is a strong interest in ensuring that all people have ready access to goods and services, 
without being regularly rejected. Moreover, commercial businesses don't inherently give notice of their religious nature in the way that the religious organization with an openly religious mission does. I would argue and have argued for the right to refuse, though, in a limited category of cases. Individuals and small businesses who object to providing personal services, the wedding videographer, the marriage counselor that precisely directly facilitate the ceremony or the relationship that, uh, that they regard as having religious significance, the marriage, the wedding, and so on, when other providers are readily available. So that category covers the cake designer in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case from a few years ago, uh, covers likely the website designer in a current case before the Supreme Court called 303 Creative. They'll serve same-sex couples in any setting except a marriage ceremony. Because their service is personal, they plausibly feel the most personal responsibility for their actions that they believe are contravening God's commands. And the harm that their refusal causes others is limited if we define the category of, of exemptions carefully and uh, precisely. So one harm from discriminatory refusals is that the customer loses access to the goods and services or incurs material cost in obtaining them elsewhere. That might be true in rural areas with few providers or lots of objectors to same-sex relationships. But in most jurisdictions with gay rights laws, the vast majority of businesses are happy to take uh, gay and lesbian couples' dollars. The other harm is dignitary. The surprise and indignity of being refused because of the vendor's religious or moral disapproval. That harm is real, but it can't be considered in isolation when a claim of liberty of conscience stands on the other side. Religion is also a fundamental identity, so penalizing the religious objector for his religiously driven conduct also imposes the dignitary harm. And the material harm to the small vendor is usually significantly greater. Uh, significant penalties, regular lawsuits, even potentially a loss of their occupation or profession. Frequent refusals would create stigma, insecurity, and anxiety, the kind of things that, kind of conditions that non-discrimination laws are meant to prevent. But again, refusals in a jurisdiction with an LGBTQ rights law are likely to be infrequent, not frequent. Now that we have online resources like WeddingWire.com that make it much easier to identify uh, LGBT inclusive, LGBT supporting vendors and avoid objectors. Places with many objectors probably don't have a non-discrimination law in the first place. Uh, so exemptions from any such law aren't a, aren't a relevant issue. You don't even have a, a law protecting gay people in the first place. Where a law does exist, a, a, a denial of material access to goods and services may justify rejecting the exemption. Okay, so in any event, if you don't agree with me about the case of refusals in the business setting, uh, the religious freedom interest is stronger in the case of nonprofit organizations for the reasons that I gave. The schools or the social services that give notice of their religious mission. We can make the distinctions between these cases, and they're worth making. They, they, are, they, they are line drawing, but they're worth making if we care about protecting both sides. <laughs> well, the other way to protect both sides is to pass legislation that would, that would do that, right? That passed legislation where it doesn't exist that would protect LGBTQ rights and religious freedom with religious, uh, through religious exemptions. Court decisions can't generally forbid discrimination by private entities. Only legislation can do that. And more than half of the states still have no statewide legislation protecting LGBTQ people <coughs> in housing or in other denials of service. 
There are also the states where LGBTQ people are least accepted and most need protection. So including religious exemptions in non-discrimination non legislation would make it easier to enact those laws in several states and in Congress. <clears throat> um, as for religious conservatives on the other side, they continue to face a growing tide. Most Americans now support various LGBTQ rights more strongly with each successive generation. If conservatives refuse non-discrimination laws with exemptions today, they'll later face laws without any religious exemptions. <clears throat> so eight years ago, Utah became the only deep red state to enact a prohibition on sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination in employment and housing. And a major reason was that the law contained strong exemptions for religious institutions and something that's come to be called the Utah Compromise. Federal legislation would protect LGBTQ people in all red states. But proposals in Congress have stalled. The Democrats' bill, the Equality Act, rightly protects LGBTQ people, but it lacks even moderate Republican support because, among other things, it denies all protection to religious dissenters. It greatly expands liability for discrimination, but it creates no new uh, religious liberty protections on the other side. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's a one-sided bill on these issues, and that means that unless Democrats somehow gain dominance in Congress, the Equality Act stands little or no chance of passing. There's another bill called the Fairness for All Act, introduced in 2019. It's supported by a small coalition of gay rights groups, and uh, LGBT rights groups, and religious conservatives. It would add non-discrimination rules in multiple different areas, employment, housing, and so on, with meaningful exemptions to protect religious organizations. The major groups on both sides, of course, have rejected that, that bill. Uh, but it is a serious attempt to protect both sides, and in principle, it could attract bipartisan support. We can take a little hope, I think, from the Respect for Marriage Act, the uh, law that passed Congress in December. The Respect for Marriage Act requires states to uh, recognize any two-person marriage, including a same-sex or interracial marriage, that is valid in the state where it was entered into. States have to recognize marriages entered in, in another state. Uh, LGBTQ rights groups feared that this Supreme Court would overturn uh, the Obergefell decision, just as it had overturned Roe versus Wade. That prospect is not really unlikely, but this bill gives certainty and reassurance uh, that same-sex couples deserve. It, doesn't pre preserve, it does not preserve the full right to same-sex marriage, but Congress probably only had the power to require states to recognize marriages from, uh, recognize each other's marriages. Probably all it had the power to do. And that requirement is important in practice. But the, uh, the Respect for Marriage Act passed the Senate, beating the filibuster only because it added religious liberty protections. So recall that one of the major fears here has been that organizations that reject same-sex marriage might lose federal tax exemptions. By analogy to the withdrawal of exemptions from the racially, uh, from racially, discri racially discriminatory schools uh, in the 1980s. And recall that President Obama's Solicitor General told the justices that that possibility was, quote unquote, certainly going to be an issue. That statement helped, uh, that statements like that uh, in 2015 and 2016 helped drive the conservative Christian fears that escalated polarization. The RMA addresses that danger, respect for Marriage Act RMA. It uh, states that the act must, you can look at the quote there as I'm going along, uh, that the act must not be read to deny or alter any tax exemption, license, or other benefit of an otherwise eligible entity or person. 
So Congress affirms legal recognition of same-sex marriage and simultaneously says that such recognition does not fall for penalizing organizations that act on their different, their different belief. That is a framework for peaceful, peaceful coexistence through protection of everyone's rights. The bill also says, last click here, that diverse beliefs about the role of gender in marriage, including, logically, that includes the traditional view that marriage is between a man and a woman, are based on decent and honorable premises and are due proper respect. So that statement distinguishes beliefs that are you know, opposing same-sex marriage from beliefs opposing interracial marriage, which receive no such uh, affirmation uh, as decent, the way beliefs about gender and marriage do. Even as the statute is also about interracial marriages, but it doesn't affirm that, the, that those beliefs against interracial marriage are, are due respect. This matters because the equation of anti-gay marriage beliefs with racist beliefs has been a common reason for rejecting any meaningful religious liberty protections. The, the Respect for Marriage Act puts Congress on record rejecting that equation. Okay, this, there's a model here that for protection of both sides. And that offers at least a bit of hope that we can protect the rights of both sides. And a lesson to each side that if it wants to protect its rights, it must acknowledge the other's rights too. That could help the Fairness for All Act, which is a much more ambitious attempt to protect both sides. And in conclusion, we should protect both. The commitment to religious liberty obviously can't counter all of the conflicts and dynamics that polarize us, but it can help reduce polarization if that commitment is strong, if it treats all faiths even-handedly, and it remains mindful of other interests. I will stop there. And look forward to questions. Uh, yes, and if people, uh, if you'll raise your hand, look at a microphone around you. Hello. Okay. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, one question I was curious about is whether you would advocate um, religious exceptions to like racial discrimination laws as well. It seems that you know a religious objection to a same-sex marriage versus religious objection to an interracial marriage would hardly be distinguishable, given that both race and sexual orientation are immutable towards someone's identity. So how would you reconcile those two? Yeah, um, so I, I do think that we can proceed and move forward making a distinction between the two. There are obviously parallels between the two. Uh, situations, parallels that completely justify uh, making sexual orientation discrimination kind of illegal under non-discrimination statutes. But I do think there are some reasons that we don't uh, need to treat it with the same kind of rigidity of rejection of exemptions that we have on the, the, the race discrimination side. There are virtually no exceptions from the anti-discrimination anti laws for race. There are exceptions for religious discrimination, there are exceptions for sex discrimination, and there are exceptions for sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination uh, already. So we, we don't treat them the same. I think there are two, two reasons. Uh, one I would say is historical. All of these forms of discrimination have been pernicious and armed people uh, in, in, in many contexts, but racial discrimination has been you know, the, most, the most pervasive, the most, uh, I think you could make the, the case that from the beginning of our constitutional order and even before that, so many aspects of American society were defined by racial discrimination. Decisions in the Constitution, provision, provisions of the Constitution protecting Constitution, to some extent, cured those, those pervasive elements in the 13th to 15th Amendments, but we know that those weren't enforced. It's been an ongoing problem 
that's that's at a, at a level that others others have. Okay. So the second distinction I think is a is a bit more conceptual, and it goes back to what I was saying about the overlap or the sorry the parallels between religious uh, identity and same sex uh, relationships. Uh, just those parallels when we're talking about a, a deep-seated identity that is either impossible or very difficult to change and that expresses itself in conduct. Those are the parallels that to me call for making more of an effort to protect both sides. Racial discrimination, not that same com complicated interaction of identity and conduct. It's you know, it's a, a, an immutable characteristic period about people. So I, I go back to the parallels between the two to, to say that's a reason why we ought to try to protect the rights of both sides because they, they stand to some extent on similar ground. Thank you. I'd just like to push that same line of thinking a little bit. <clears throat> I don't think they're parallel. I think they're overlapping, actually. I think they're the same because a lot of anti-miscegenation laws were based on religious grounds. Bob Jones University didn't um, start, they, they had prohibited interracial dating and marriage until 2000 when I think George W. Bush went to visit and got a lot of flack for visiting there. So I think originally you find a lot of anti Interracial marriage laws were created, were were, were were found. The foundation was people's deeply held religious beliefs, and there actually are exceptions to religious discrimination. The Civil Rights Act of 1965 actually allows discrimination for employ for employers with fewer than five employees because they wanted to protect as part of that compromise yeah. small southern families that just they just were not going to get on board with not discriminating against their black neighbors. So what do you do? If a town, five a business with five employees or less, not subject to the Civil Rights Act, um, decides, I just don't believe in interracial marriage, and so I don't want to provide services to you, mixed family, or your, you know, your racial offspring. That that seems to me we're talking about the issue is the conflict, right? So what do you do? How do you, I hate the term splitting the baby because it's so offensive and <laughs> disgusting. But I think that's kind of what we're talking about here. How do you split this baby when someone wants to discriminate? They, they're, they have a deeply held personal right to discriminate against somebody else. And I also just take issue with the fact of equating, equating someone's race with someone's religious beliefs. I don't think beliefs are immutable. Uh, okay, so... Yeah, I, I, what I, so what I was saying about the treatment of, of racial discrimination is that there are almost no exemptions uh, identified as, 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 as for racial discrimination. The Civil Rights Act, the Federal Civil Rights Act doesn't apply to, peop, to employers with under 15 employees or people up, is it five? For the public accommodations, I don't, I, I don't remember. Uh, but in terms of the, the, the kind of the treatment of race versus other forms of discrimination, it remains the kind of the most rigorous, rigorously enforced uh, prohibited ground, right? There's bona fide occupational co uh, qualification defense to other forms of discrimination, but not to racial discrimination. We have uh, exemptions in, for example, the Fair Housing Act that allow groups to uh, act on the uh, basis of religion to choose uh, lodgers on the basis of religion uh, if they're a, a, a religious organization, but not if membership in the organization is determined on the basis of race. So that's what I'm saying is that the, the laws treat the two differently in that sense. I agree clearly that there have been, you know, religious reasons offered for, for racial discrimination throughout history. Um, but we made a judgment 
uh, primarily in, you know, in the 1960s as a reaction to and a response to uh, you know, 100, 100 years after the Civil War, still an ongoing pervasive uh, oppression of people based on race, that exemptions were going to be very narrow. I don't know that we have to make that exact judgment about other forms of discrimination in the same way. Nor, so go back on the race, racial, you know, the kind of the very no exemptions approach to race. That would be, there's kind of path dependence here, I would, I would put it. That, you know, the way race became central in America, racial discrimination and racial oppression became central in America, uh, has led us to treat it distinctively in the law. And I think we can, we can proceed on that basis, distinguishing between the two kinds of discrimination. Hi. Um, so if we go down the route of trying to sort of, and, and as I see it, sort of reach a compromise between, in, in the example of the cake baker, exactly where you draw the line, I think the difficulty I see in my head is that makes sense from a high level. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to make a hard decision of where to draw the line. And so how, what principles do you use in order to make what I think at the end of the day is going to be an arbitrary decision of where that line gets from? Because at the, at the high level, I can understand the idea of trying to balance both sides. But at some point, you have to put a, put a line of this is allowed and this isn't. And so how, how does one decide that? Yeah, so I mean, just that was a very brief start at it in the last part of the talk. But I, uh, you're, you're, you're talking about mitigating the harm. You're talking about identifying the harm and trying to prevent the more serious harms and, the, and, and allow effects that are not as serious because there's something on the other side. Right? So that, that, that's not a clue. There, there, there are not black and white lines there. But I don't think they're arbitrary. I, I do think that the, that the two uh, elements of notice to the, the beneficiary or the customer or whoever that, the, uh, that the, the service provider may rely on a religious, uh, it would be sort of will rely on a religious uh, tenant together with alternative providers, those are things that affect the likelihood of harm occurring and the scope of and the serious, seriousness of the harm as well, right? Can you avoid refusals? Can you go somewhere else easily? Makes, I think, for a, a strong principle of protecting the nonprofit and a much more limited principle a limited protection for the, you know, the small commercial business. You know, and we can say more than that. I don't think that's arbitrary. I agree that it's not, like, you know, absolutely uh, set clear, clear line. But that there are distinctions that we can make if we care about both sides. Thank you so much for your talk. I really appreciate the way you try to bring what's seen as both sides together, having been in the Bay Area for decades, um, and specifically uh, being immersed in progressive circles at Stanford and in Palo Alto. It feels like often I see hostility towards particularly traditional Christians simmer very close to the surface, and I think this could be the start of more meaningful dialogue. Um, regarding the the Respect to Marriage Act. I had heard that some Republicans in Congress voted against it because they felt this set things up so that religious traditionalists could be targeted. Could you, I, I, I read a bunch of articles. I couldn't quite find any specific details or examples. Do you, do you know of any, or do you think what they said was just a, a political a political move? Yeah, so uh, I... I had a little, little bit of an involvement with the act uh, with three other scholars, colleagues from other institutions. I wrote a letter to senators saying that the religious liberty protections were, were pretty meaningful. 
and that it was worth going forward, even if you cared about religious liberty, worth going forward on this act because it provided same-sex couples with the kind of certainty that they deserved. And it made a statement, by having these protections in it, it made a statement that we can protect both sides. So I think, you know, there were various arguments made against the act. Some of them were uh, really weak. Others were, were more debatable. Uh, there was an argument, for example, that and what the act says is that any person acting as a state actor must recognize a marriage from another state. Under color of state law is the exact language. It's a phrase used in Supreme Court decisions and statutes for, for more than a century. Uh, they argued that, that again, some of the opponents argued that lots and lots of religious organizations could be called state actors or treated as acting under color of state law. And that's, I think that's a really weak argument. Uh, this, the Supreme Court's law on this is quite strong that private actors, even if they receive government money, even if they receive a lot of government money, don't become state actors that way. And you'd be imagining this court changing all of those rules to find a lot more liability on private actors, not likely from this court, but it only happens if this court, first of all, overturns Obergefell, right? So they're willing to go far enough to the right to overturn Obergefell, and then come over here and expand liability for state action on the left at the same time. It's just very unlikely to happen, right? So those kinds of things uh, are weak. The more significant possibility, I think, is what you saw happen, and we talked a little bit about the, the tax exemptions for racially discriminatory schools in the 1970s and 80s. The decision, Bob Jones, that allowed withdrawing those said, the reason why the IRS can do this uh, is that we have many, many statements from Congress through legislation that racial discrimination in education is a fundamental Wrong, a fundamental violation of national policy. So what the Catholic bishops and others said here about the Respect for Marriage Act is that the more laws there are that recognize uh, sexual orientation discrimination as wrong or recognize same-sex marriage rights, the more they make things start to line up with the race situation. We have lots and lots of legislation. Uh, and that could lead to saying there's an overwhelming interest in, say, withdrawing tax exemptions or other, kind, other kinds of penalties on religious organizations. I think that language from the Respect for Marriage Act, not airtight in cutting off that sort of argument, but it certainly puts up a barrier to it, right? This shall not be construed to deny or alter anyone's tax exemption. Right? It's, now, there are ways still to argue that it, it might still be used that way, even within that language. Um, but it, this is a balancing of likely, likely effects, and I don't think it's very likely that, uh, given, those, given those exemptions, I don't think the Respect for Marriage Act is going to create a, a groundswell towards, uh, towards you know, overriding tax exemptions. Or, or, I think it's actually a fair argument that you can't use it at all as a piece of evidence that tax exemptions should be taken away because the statute says it can't be construed that way. So there are good arguments, I mean, decent arguments and really weak ones, even the decent arguments, I think, the act takes care of pretty well. Thanks. Make sense? Yeah. Thanks. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, so I think you know, you said it's a balancing act and that religious liberty is respecting people's religious liberty unless there's a powerful reason, uh, you know, to restrict it. And you know, you've talked a lot about, like, standards for agreeing on the religious li liberty part or establishing that right. But to me, it feels like the problem will always be the other end of the scale, which is that there's, on the left and right, just fundamental disagreements about arms and whether or not which reasons are powerful. So, you know, if there's a 
the case over uh, Native Americans using peyote in religious ceremonies. People on the left may not, you know, see the use of peyote at all as that much of a harm, and therefore there's not really a powerful reason, whereas people on the right may see, you know, drugs as destroying society or something like that. And it seems like each issue is going to have the counterposing reason where there won't be agreement, even if you can unite people on the, you know, on one end of the scale. So how, how could we overcome this if each religious liberty case is going to prevent, or we're going to you know, put forth a new potential powerful reason that maybe the left and the right have disagreements about? Yeah, I mean, I've said the problem is that people let their underlying views affect their view, view about religious liberty in any case. And you're saying, well, why wouldn't they, right? Because the right religious liberty is not absolute. Um, and so the, your view about the strength of the interest is going to, is going to, is going to matter. Um, I think that's, that's inevitable to some extent. The question is, can we reduce it? Can we find some things that will help us uh, provide for some freedom, even as to things that we think are important? Because right? uh, uh, okay, so there are I mean there are a few there are a few things to say about that, um, and it gets kind of down into the weeds uh, of religious liberty law, but statutes and the Supreme Court's constitutional rulings tend to say, when you're looking at a question of whether religious conduct should be exempt from a law, you're not looking at the interest underlying the law as a whole. You're looking at the interest in denying an exemption for this group. Now, if peyote became you know, widely used in society, maybe there would be some problems with it. There are physical dangers from it, right? And hallucinogenic drugs, serious hallucinogens have, have problems as well. But when peyote is used by a small group in, there was evidence used in a controlled setting with guidelines on it by the Native American church. Actually, that church had a record of helping Native Americans with the alcoholism problem that's that's been, been a problem. Um, maybe the interest in denying the exception is a totally different thing from the interest in making the drug illegal in the first place. Right? And you can say the same thing about anti-discrimination laws. Right? If we were talking about discrimination across the board and across society, well, there are very, very strong interests in that. The question is about the margin, the interest of the margin, the exemption for the Catholic foster care agency that's one of 20 agencies in Philadelphia that does foster care placements, and the other 19 are happy to serve same-sex couples. Um, that interest is a lot less than if the others were discriminating as well, or if we got rid of the, the non-discrimination law altogether. So that, that's an example of how maybe we can find ways to balance even if we disagree about the strength of the overall law. Make sense? We might have time for one more. Again, thank you for the speech this evening. Two things seem to me. Uh, one is the wall of church and state is beginning to look more like a piece of Swiss cheese. And when you offer a balancing act, you always have to look at the weight of each of the items placed on the scale. Otherwise, you can't come up with what is really making your balance. What theory of the constitutional, of interpretation of the Constitution, do you believe best supports your position? Uh, sort of a, an overall theory of yes. interpreting the Constitution. Yeah. Uh, well, I think I'm thinking about um, there's there's a sort of a classic mode of interpretation that says when we look at a legal provision, we look at the evils that it was meant to counteract. Right? What was the background of it? What was the things that they were 
responding to. And I think that's the structure of the argument I've, I've made here, that the evils of imposing suffering on people as a result of their faith, and therefore creating conflict, and back and forth conflict and cycle of retaliation, is what the religion clauses were meant to, to, to stop. Um, and I think we have a soft version of that going on in the United States now. Um, so to just quickly uh, say something about the other uh, point that you raised, um, I'm not, uh, I, I think uh, at least much of what the court has done on the free exercise side of the First Amendment is, uh, is I think, very justified under this, under this point of view. Uh, I'm not as happy with what they're doing on the establishment clause side. I do think, for example, that they got the case about the high school football coach, uh, Coach Kennedy, uh, who prayed at the end of the game. Um, I, I think they got that wrong. Not that there's not an important interest in the uh, him, him being able to pray, you know, even in some somewhere around his job setting. Uh, but they, uh, they, uh, I think, diminish too much the potential for players to be coerced by that or pressured to do that. It had happened before players had started uh, praying with him because he started to do it. The court said essentially, we didn't see any coercion here because the players were over with the band singing the fight, singing the alma mater at the end of the game. That's right on a narrow interpretation of the record, but I, th they, I think they should have said, thought more, or done more with the, the potential that that won't last, that that equilibrium won't last, that eventually the players will start coming over and praying with him again because of that, uh, that dynamic. And I think if the court's going to take coercion seriously on the free exercise side, it should take it seriously and, and understand it flexibly on that side too. So I have some sympathy for what you're saying, but I, uh, on the free exercise clause, I think much of what the court has done is, is quite justified. Uh, so thank you very, thank you very much, Tom, and please uh, join me in thanking. Tom. Thank you. Enjoy it. The next. Uh, Constitutional Law Center event will be on February 23rd in the evening. Uh, it will be our annual Publius Symposium. Uh, this is where we honor a, a very recently published book in the field of constitutional law for those who are not into the sort of thing. Publius was the, was the uh, uh, name under which the Federalist Papers were published. So. Uh, this year, our uh, honored book is by Allison LaCroix of the University of Chicago Law School, and it's a history of constitutional developments, basically between the War of 1812 and the Civil War, a period of time which I think many people, including serious legal historians, Jack might be able to nod or, or shake his head, like perhaps don't pay as much attention to as they do either to the founding or to more more recent times, but Allison's book is a fascinating uh, study, and then there will be three commentators uh, on the book, so I uh, encourage you all to, uh, uh, to come to that, and, uh, and with that, again, thank you, Tom, and thank you for your uh, attention tonight.